Okay, in today's video, we are going to be going over the motion of charged particles in electric fields. And we're going to be talking about charged particles that are moving across or perpendicular to the electric field. If you want to know about charged particles that are moving parallel or along the electric field, then link to those videos in the upper right-hand corner up here. And you can see that information also. In this video, we're going to be talking about the velocity, the acceleration, and the displacement. Before we get started, please don't forget subscribe to my channel step-by-step -step science get all my excellent physics chemistry and math videos support my channel give me a thumbs up for this video leave me a nice positive comment in the comment section below thank you very much let's get started okay we have electric fields here's our electric field we have a positive charge plate we have a negative charge plate the electric field goes from the positive to the negative and we're going to send in this positively charged particle from left to right in this direction now here it's outside the field it's going to be coming from the left, and it already has some initial velocity in the x direction. Something else gave it that initial velocity in the x direction. And when it enters that field, then it's going to fly off in that direction and make that curved parabolic path like that. Okay, it makes that curved parabolic path. When it does that, it's moving in the x direction and in the y direction at the same time. The sum of the motion in the x and the sum of the motion in the y makes it have that curved parabolic path like that. Okay, now let's talk about first, before we talk about what's doing in the x and the y, let's talk about what's happening, what forces are acting on that object as it moves through that electric field. Okay, so it's moving like this, has this curved path. At some point it was somewhere around here and anywhere it is in that path, there's only one force acting on it and that is the electric force and the electric force is down in the negative direction. That's the only force. It's just like in mechanics, in gravitation, when you kick something or throw something and it's flying through the air, the only force that's acting on it is the force of gravity. When it's up there, flying through the air, it's only acting, being acted upon by the force of gravity. A lot of people think, well, it's moving from left to right, it's moving this direction. There must be some force that's causing it to move from left to right. Well, there was some force over here that got it going in the, in the first place. But once it's going, as Newton's first law said, objects in motion stay in motion, objects at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. There's no forces, so therefore we know that the initial and the final velocity in the x direction are going to be the same. The only force is the negative, is the electric force in the negative y direction. Okay, now let's talk about what it's doing in the x direction first. We kind of went over that. There's no forces acting on it in the x direction. Therefore, we can say the forces are balanced, and therefore, it's moving at a constant velocity. And most importantly, you need to remember that if it's moving at a constant velocity and it has balanced forces, then there's no acceleration. In the x direction, there's no acceleration. And as I said, that means that the final velocity in the x direction is going to be equal to the initial velocity in the x direction. The velocity in the x direction doesn't change. Okay, you need to remember that that's important. And then, because there's no accel acceleration, we can use this nice, simple equation that says the velocity is equal to the distance divided by the time. Okay, so if you wanted to find the time it takes to go through, if we know the distance across and we know the initial velocity, then we can find the time. And that's going to be important because the time in the x and the time in the y are going to be the same, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Okay, so that's the x direction. In the y direction, there is a force, it's the electric force that's acting in the negative y direction. That means the forces are unbalanced, and that means it is accelerating. It's not experiencing constant velocity in the y direction. It's accelerating. And actually, the initial velocity as it enters in the y direction is zero. And then as it starts to move down, it's increasing, it's accelerating in the y direction. Okay, and therefore, in the for if we wanted to calculate the acceleration, we can use this equation to calculate the acceleration. That's one of the two common equations you would use to calculate the acceleration. Okay, we'll talk about the other equation when we do an example in just a moment. Okay, so, and then it's important to remember, as I mentioned, that the time to go in the y is the same as the time to go in the x. And we could often calculate the x because we know the initial velocity, we know the distance across the electric field, we can calculate the time using this equation, the time in the x, and then in order to get the distance or something else that it moves in the y, we can say, or we know that the time in the y is equal to the time in the x. The time to go through the distance that goes in the x direction 
is equal to the time it takes to go its distance in the y direction, and we have x plus y equals that position right there. Okay? So Okay, so this is the example problem we're going to go through for this video, and it says here, with a velocity of 9.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, an electron enters a homogeneous electric field between the parallel plates of a capacitor, and it's going to be traveling perpendicular to the electric field. So these orange lines are the plates of the capacitor. There's an electric field which goes from the positive to the negative, and um, that electron is be coming in here with some initial velocity. This is our electron, and it's going to be traveling with some initial velocity, and it's going to be traveling perpendicular to the electric field, and it's going to take this parabolic curve path like that. Approximately, it says the plates of the capacitor are square, and they have a length of 65 millimeters, and they have a distance between them of 50 millimeters, and the potential difference between the plates is 150 volts. And we want to be able to answer, I think I have five questions here. We want to know what is the acceleration of the electron in the y direction. We want to know how much time does it take for the electron to travel through the capacitor. We want to know how far from the x-axis the electron will be when it leaves the plates of the capacitor. What will the velocity be of the electron in the y direction when it leaves the capacitor or leaves the electric field? And we also want to determine the angle. I think we're going to do the magnitude of the velocity of the electron that it makes with the x-axis when it leaves that electric field. So we want to answer those five questions I think we had. Here's the information. Here's our diagram that we can refer to. And the first thing is we want to know what is the acceleration of the electron in the y direction. Now, there's kind of two equations that we can use. This is one of them, and this is the other one. You can see in this problem, okay, we're given that uh, u and d, so the, 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 the distance between the plates and the potential difference. So we're going to use this equation. We could easily calculate e, the electric field strength, because we know the Potential difference is equal to E times D. We could solve that for E, which would give us the potential difference times the distance, and we could substitute that in here. But we have everything we need to use this equation, so we're simply going to write that equation down. We're going to plug the values in. Now, I, I didn't think I'd give it to you, but you know it's an electron, and the charge on an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The potential difference is 150. The mass uh, of an electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and that's the distance between the plates. It says here 50 millimeters. Please remember that is 50 times 10 to the minus 3. It must be in meters. So you can't just put 50 in there. All right. If we do that, then we get an acceleration of about 5.3 times 10 to the 14 meters per second squared acceleration. Okay, next one is how much time. Now, we have to remember this. It's important. When the electron flies in from the left-hand side here, it's already moving with some initial velocity when it enters the electric field. Okay, it's going to be moving perpendicular to the electric field, and we want to know how much time it's going to take to move through the capacitor. Now, in the x direction, there's no forces acting on that electron. There's only a force, the electric force, acting on that electron. In the y direction, in the x direction, there is going to be no forces, there's going to be a constant velocity and no acceleration, so we can simply use this equation because we know the distance is 65 millimeters, and we want to figure out the time because we're given the initial velocity. That means the time is equal to, going to be equal to the distance divided by the velocity. The distance is 65 times 10 to the minus 3 meters. The initial velocity in the x direction is 9.0 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. It's going to have a constant velocity in the x direction, so we can use this equation when we have no acceleration. And we get that the time that it would take to travel through that capacitor is 7.2 times 10 to the minus 9 seconds. And I just want to point out, because we're going to use this in the next slides, that this is the time we calculated to go in the x direction. But we know when the electron flies through that capacitor, through that electric field, it's moving in the x and the y direction at the same time. So therefore, we know that the time it takes to go in the x direction is going to be equal to the time it takes to go in the y direction. So if we need the time it takes to go in the y direction, we can simply use what we calculated for the time in the x, which is this time right here. Okay? Don't forget that. That is an important point. So we want to know how far from the x-axis the electron is when it leaves the plates of the capacitor. Now, for some people, this is a little confusing because it says how far from the x-axis. Now, what we're really finding is how far did it move along the y-axis. The distance away from the x-axis is in the y-direction. 
So we want to actually find the distance in the y direction. People get a little confused. So they think, okay, how far is it like along the x-axis or something like that? But what we're really finding is the distance in the y, which is equal to the initial velocity in the y, because this is y, times the time it takes to go in the y, which we calculated in the previous slide. We know the x, and now we know the y time. One half a t squared, and this has to be the acceleration also in the y direction. We're finding the value for the y, so we got to use all the values for the y. Now we know when the electron comes in, it's moving in this direction only, therefore the initial velocity in the y direction, important, in the y direction is zero. So our equation simplifies to delta y equals one half at squared. Now we want to find the distance, so we can simply plug those values in. It's one half, the acceleration which we calculated in the y direction, I think we did that on the first slide, the time, this is what we calculated in the previous slide. Remember, we calculated the time in the x, but we know the time in the x is equal to the time in the y, so it's the same time. And therefore, we got to square that, and we get the time, excuse me, we get the distance that it moves away from the x-axis, or the distance that it moves along the y-axis, is 1.37 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. All right? Just like that. All right, any, uh, any other questions? I think we can go on. Okay, D, what's the velocity of the electron in the y direction when it leaves? Let's just point out once again that the velocity in the x is constant, so we know the velocity in the x when it leaves, but we want to know the velocity in the y, so we've got to have an equation for that, and that's that the final velocity in the y squared is equal to the initial velocity in the x, uh, excuse me, also in the y squared, uh, plus 2a delta y. All, right, all of this is for the y. We once again know that in the y direction, it didn't have an initial velocity. The initial velocity was zero, so the equation simplifies to this. The final velocity squared in the y direction is equal to 2a delta y. This is the acceleration in the y direction. We can just take the square root of both sides, and we get the final velocity in the y is equal to that, which we just plugged the values in. This is 2, because there's a 2 here. This is the acceleration in the y direction. This is the distance that's going to go away from the x-axis, which is the distance in the y direction. And we can take the square root of all of that, and we get that the final velocity in the y direction is equal to 3.8 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Remember, this is the initial and the final in the x because there's no acceleration. This is the final velocity in the y direction. The initial velocity in the y direction was zero. Okay, let's see. I think we... Um, have this one last problem, which is two parts, because we're going to find the magnitude and the direction of the velocity. And I think we're going to find the magnitude first. So this says determine the angle of the velocity of the electron that the determine the angle that the velocity of the electron makes with the x-axis when it leaves the electric field. Okay, here's the electron, here's the electron. We know that these are our final velocities. Okay, remember this is not changed from the x. This is we just calculated. So we're going to draw a vector that represents each of those. That's the final velocity in the x. That's the final velocity in the y. Now, I made them somewhat proportional because this is approximately half of this, a little less than half, but I tried to make it about half. So you can see these are the velocities, and that represents some motion that's going to be in this direction because we can take that vector for the y and move it, and you can see we have a right triangle now. That green line, the hypotenuse of that right triangle, is going to be the sum of these two vectors, and that's our final resultant velocity. We can use the Pythagorean theorem. V squared is equal to Vf, final x squared, final y squared. We can take the square root of both sides, and we get that the final velocity, the resultant velocity, is the square root, the sum of the square roots of the other two final velocities, and that means that the final velocity, the magnitude of that vector, is 9.8 times 10 to the 6 meters per second, okay? And that should make sense because this is 9, this is 3.8, it's a little longer, so the then that one has to be the longest side of that triangle. Okay, now the last thing is we're going to find the angle. Find the angle, we need our trig functions, we know now all three sides, but we're kind of given, or we had previously calculated these two sides, so oftentimes we just use the tangent. Remember, the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent, so katoa. Toa opposite over adjacent, and this says the arc tangent, inverse tangent of the angle. This is the angle we're trying to find here. This is supposed to be a lambda. It's supposed to be a lambda for the angle. Plug the values in. Uh, the inverse tangent of the angle 
uh, is equal to the ratio of those two sides, the opposite over the adjacent, and then you get 0 0.442, and then if you take the arc or the inverse tangent of that, you get that that angle is approximately 23 degrees. Okay, so there you go. We did A, B, C, D, E, five different things. I think that's pretty complete. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, which I hope you did, please do all the following four things. Subscribe to my channel. Please subscribe to my channel. Support my channel, Step-by-Step -step Science. Get all my excellent physics, chemistry, and math videos. Take a little bit of time, please. Give me a thumbs up. Leave me a nice positive comment. And don't forget, sharing is caring. Show your friends how much you care for them and share this video with them. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.